Up next, we react to the discovery that mold that is near Chernobyl may be feeding off of radioactive material. All right, coming back, Tune Day. Recently, we saw a story that went into how, you know, there, there's there's life that has grown in the wake of the Chernobyl. Chernobyl is where there was a, the worst nuclear disaster um, over in Europe. And, um, you know, it's, there's a no-go zone, you know, for humans at least. And But in that no-go zone, scientists have gone and checked on seeing what's going on. They've seen, you know, boar and all these wild boar and things. Like, things have evolved in certain ways there that, you know, have been... Interesting, you know, but today we wanted to talk about something in particular where they found mold that's growing there uh, that seems to be feeding on the radiation and and like eating the radiation, you know, in a way that is like getting rid of the radiation, so to speak, or or consuming the radiation to where it it may not necessarily be as harmful anymore, Um, which was not something (laughs) that was expected to be found or something that we even knew that that mold was doing. Um, So. This seems to be quite, I don't know if it's an ev- necessarily an evolution, but this seems to be quite an interesting finding that, that there we now have species, uh, you know, fungi and mold and so forth that can, that apparently can eat radiation. So what, what's your reaction to this discovery? And I want to get into, you know, like you, you, whether you want to get into kind of the mechanisms that they've seen that with this and what can be learned from that, but also just th- this potentially could be useful in a lot of different ways. So your, your reaction yeah. I think I think the, the the last thing you said to me is the interesting part of, of how can this be put to use. Um, so first, I would say my reaction is it's pretty fascinating. It's, uh, it reminds me we did a show. Um, this is probably going back a couple of years um, about um, enzymes that they discovered that eat plastic. Um, yeah. And I feel like this is similar, where it's like some sort of silver lining to the conversation we just had um, in, in the first half of this discussion about. Um, kind of the, the drop in insect population due to things like pollution and all these other issues that we don't you know seem to like as a society, the, the negative offshoots of, of how, we, how we live right now. And so I think radiation and nuclear stuff is part of that. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan conceptually of nuclear energy as a way to power cities and, and get electricity because it's cleaner than the fossil fuel way of burning coal and, and, and those. But I recognize... That, um, you know, the Fukushima plant, Chernobyl, um, there's a trade-off whenever the nuclear power plant has an issue uh, for society. So this, this, that's why I say it's very interesting that, that there could be, uh, if, if there's a fungus that actually thrives off of consuming radiation, that means that in the long run, maybe there's a way for the scientific community to develop this in a way that could make nuclear production of nuclear energy safer for us as a society so that if there is an next Chernobyl, maybe it can be contained a lot quicker or something like that. Um, well, yeah, I, mean, so, yeah it, I find it fascinating. Yeah. Like th- this is something that seems like we could leverage. Um, now I'm not a fan of nuclear power, but the reason is a little different than the, the, the issue with nuclear power that I have actually isn't even the Fukushima or the, the Chernobyl issue. Those, you know, th- those are problems that we would want to address. My issue is actually just that we don't have anything to do with the waste from the nuclear, it's not carbon, it's not carbon waste, but it does produce waste. And it's like when it's radioactive and it's radioactive for millions of years. So what do we do with that stuff? And so that to me, but, but apparently <laughs> we, maybe we have a mold that would allow some fungus or, you know, an organism that can be used to, to render the waste that is normally toxic or you're radioactive. Um, this render this waste something that's less toxic or less radioactive, um, which would change my mind on the the, the viability yeah. or the whether nuclear power has it has a role. Um, you know, so on Earth, it seems like this could have great implications if we can figure out what's going on. And I, I don't necessarily think you got to figure out if you got to know everything about it is more so you need to know how to use it, you know, how to use this to your advantage. There are a lot of natural phenomena that we don't necessarily understand, but we know how to use, you know, uh, I mean, sleep. <laughs> we, we don't we don't know exactly how that works, but we know hey, we got to lay down every day, go to sleep, and wake up. And I, hey man, if I, don't I don't know how my toilet work, works, but I use it. Say what? I, say, I don't know how my toilet works, but I use it. <laughs> well, I, I mean, yeah, there you go. Um, one of the things that was very interesting to me about this, though, was actually the mechanism that, you know, in, in the studying how this works is that these these organisms are very high in melanin, you know, which, you know, is something, is, is yeah. something that 
is can be helpful when you're dealing with sun rays, you know, and it can be helpful when you're dealing apparently, you know, light is a form of radiation. You know, you got visible light is on that spectrum of the, 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 um, the radio, the the spectrum and where there's, you know, like infrared and all that UV, all those different forms of radiation, visible lights, one of them. And so melanin, these organisms are very high in melanin and the melanin helps them deal with kind of the radio radiation that's coming off because these forms of radiation, when they're when they're forms that we can't handle, what it does is it, it messes up DNA. It messes up, you know, it like knocks things loose, and it's like, oh my gosh, this thing is gonna this thing is gonna mutate now, or it's gonna be bad. So the fact that these organisms can withstand that, and then actually leverage the and not much they call it radio synthesis. So not much different than a plant can utilize the the the, the radiation that's coming that in the form of visible light, and then create energy from that. This mold is able to use other forms of radiation, not necessarily the visible light, but other forms, you know, that the, the, this radioactive material is creating and then create energy from that. So to me, just, I mean, it, it's kind of like just one of these fascinating things that, you know, like the, 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 the what is it, the, the quote from Jurassic World, like life finds a way, so to speak, like the, this, yeah. this organism has been left in this radioactive space for for 30 years, 40 years, and it's learned how to take advantage of the resource that's available there, you know? So it's just, it's fascinating yeah. to me from that standpoint. No, I agree. And, um, you know, the melanin thing stuck out to me too. Um, I'm trying to figure out how um, to incorporate this new finding of melanin in fungus that can then um, consume radiation and kind of have a shield against being harmed with um the great replacement theory and how that might replace fungus that doesn't have melanin. And we're going to get a whole, you know, thing online and people are going to make commercials about genes and all this stuff. And, and then other people are going to get mad and, and it's all going to be about this fungus. So I'm, I'm waiting for that. But until that happens, um, I do find it interesting, James, because it's another, like you said about the Jurassic Park quote, that's another thing I was thinking of. You know, life is pretty amazing. You know, I think that's the part of the lesson is just to just, yeah, we're, the idea of consuming energy from for an organism um, and the idea that, like you said, that that ecosystem of Chernobyl was immediately thrown out of whack because of the nuclear um, um, catastrophe there. And there were certain organisms, obviously at a cellular level, you know, it's kind of fungus, that were able to respond to that and create a new source of energy out of the abundance of radiation. And the, the problem, I think you always say it this way, like, you know, climate change and all this and, and the arguments we have in our society is like, oh, life, life's going to be OK. I know that's your joke. Humans might not. Yeah. And I think Chernobyl and this fungus is a great example because humans can not live still in the areas really around that nuclear power plant. Some of the articles I read alluded to that, that, that the, the, radi- the levels of radiation are still too high for humans to be safe. But this fungus is fine. Yeah. So it's thriving. That's an example. Like, oh, yeah. 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 So that's an example that we we can create an environment on Earth that is very unfavorable for humans, but other life will be fine. And I think it's another example, too, where um, this is why I do believe there's life on other planets. Oh, this is where I'm about to go. Yeah. Well, this is whether it's life that we consider intelligent or that we could communicate with is a different story. I mean, you know, that I got to wait to see. But this is another reason that the fungus can grow under uh, extreme amounts of, or what we would consider extreme amounts of radiation. That gives an argument that, yeah, maybe a, a planet can have life on it without having such a robust and thick atmosphere and a magnetic field and kind of all the things yeah. that seem to be the secret sauce of, of the earth being able to do this. Um, and again, whether those fungus could eventually over a million years develop into advanced organisms like us, who knows? But could there be fungus on other planets like this? Yeah. I mean, I don't see why not. Well, yeah, that was actually, that was where I was about to go, is that this to me, like, you already have kind of these, we have organisms that live in extreme environments on Earth that we were aware of already, like the the animals that live at the, 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 the organisms that live in the bottom or in the ocean at these vent, these geothermal vents where there's warm like volcanic heated, you know, uh, water shooting out of these vents and there are organisms that live there. So it's like, okay, these, and these organisms don't need the sun. They don't, you know, all they're, they're in, in, they're submerged in, in water, but conceivably that could be another liquid. Um, and they're getting heat from 
activity inside of the planet and they're they're living based on that you know and so that's the kind of thing that could live somewhere i could live in titan you know like one of the moons um you know and then planets in our solar system this is another example of type of life that could exist as you said without our our atmosphere is blocking a lot of the radiation that would otherwise make earth earth inhospitable you know in the same way that the moon or mars are inhospitable because there's no way to block all that radiation um and these organisms apparent or this organism apparently is able to to very quickly was able to adapt to be able to live in a place with all that rate with all the bunch of radiation so it to me it makes pretty clear that okay well this an organism like this or organisms could evolve and adapt to be able to live in a high radiation environment somewhere else in the solar system or the, or the galaxy or the universe or whatever so that was that that's the other takeaway from here and i know even um you know, in, in the, the one of the piece that we're, we're going to share that, that we, we looked at for this, they were talking about that you could put this material, put these organisms on like the exterior of spacecraft and they can help absorb, you know, the the the, the radiation just out there in space. Again, because our, our, once we leave our atmosphere, we don't have anything to shield us from the, the radiation that's out there um, that some of which is harmful to us. So, you know, like th- but that kind of once you have that kind of idea, then you kind of have to take a step back and say, well, hold up. If, if I'm going to use this organism as a shield in space, that means this organism could potentially thrive in environments that we would not conceive life being able to thrive in thus far. So, yeah, I, I was I, I was pretty fascinated by by this and the, the possibilities that it opens up. Me, the, I guess said it said differently, the way that it expands how we conceive where life could be and where life could flourish. Yeah, no, I agree. And I I think it's also like when I look at these kind of revelations, let's say these discoveries, it always, I I try and say to myself, you know, this is why as humanity, we just need to be humble um, because we don't know everything. I mean, think about it, James, We, we have been taught, I mean, obviously nuclear bombs and that type of extreme radiation is bad for life obviously, especially when it's got the thermal blast and all that. But I don't think anyone would have thought 30, 40 years ago that this would happen, that there would be life thriving in Chernobyl. Um, Because, I mean, this isn't part of our discussion, but there's also wolves and boars and other animals that seem to be okay in in this higher elevated radiation. And people didn't predict that. And I think that's where my concern is today, James, with where we are as a society in our current discourse around things like AI, where we have our cultural leaders telling us that this is going to solve everything in the world and all the problems of humanity. And I think this is an example where, I mean, AI wouldn't have predicted that this fungus could eat could eat um, radiation, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> until this happens, no one knew that this could happen. And so I just think that it's an, a, this learning about things like this is an example for me that we need to stay humble as humans. We need to always remind ourselves that we don't understand everything about the environment and the world around us and why things happen. And this is very interesting that this did happen. And to your point, if they can put it outside of spaceships and all that stuff in the future, great. Let's go learn how it happened. But it's another example of we're going to have other discoveries like this that are just going to happen off yeah. of the backs well, of yeah, I mean, it, things that seem like catastrophes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a good point and I commend you for making it. Although I would say, here's where I'll, I'll put my Tunde hat on and tell you that what you're saying is impossible. It's been very clear, <laughs> if you study history, that humans cannot survive generally without feeling like they understand everything that's going on around them. Yeah. And like, if you go back 2,000 years, you go to places and they will swear up and down to you that in order for it to rain tomorrow, they need to sacrifice a virgin. And they will be very comfortable that that is a fact and that is a true. And so they, if they had to sacrifice the right version, then the gods will be happy and it'll rain tomorrow. And so people were not walking around saying, oh, well, I don't know why it re- rains and I'm OK with that. You know, like so we've always humans have always looked for things made up stuff or whatever. Look, find stories, find things that will allow us to explain and be comfortable that we understand what's going on around us. And so, yes, it, it, at minimum, we should keep our eyes open so that when we see something new, we can learn from it and not ignore it because it's something that we didn't 
uh, actually, you know, that, that isn't accounted for in the stories we already have. But we see that that's what's happened. That would happen. You know, Christianity for the longest time was suppressing science. So that because anytime science would not confirm something that Christianity said, if, hey, well, if the earth is not the center of the universe, then you got to, and you say it is, then you got to die. It's like, well, <laughs> hold up. <laughs> I'm just looking out and looking at a telescope, man. Why do I got to die? But it's like, well, because our God said that the earth is, or, you know, the people that speak for our God said that the earth is the center of the universe. So it's, it, it, it's, a, it's honorable. Hopefully there will be people that take heed to your message. And I mean, the, the, the humility, the, Hey, we have something we can learn still, but it doesn't seem like by and large that human beings are able to adopt that kind of mentality. People, there are many people seem to need the certainty that and, and with if science doesn't provide it, then religion will provide it or AI will provide it or something else will provide it. And that's just that's just kind of seems to be our MO. Or a fungus. <laughs> so maybe, but I think we can wrap. Maybe up that'll there. be my my certainty. I'll be that's certain. Your certainty. All right. <laughs> well, so what I think we can wrap from there. It, it, but nonetheless, I mean, it, it's something new to learn, something new to see. And you, you should always keep it. You know, follow the advice of Tune Day. You keep an open mind and you can learn something new. You keep your eyes open. So. But we appreciate everybody for joining us on this episode of Call Like I See It. Subscribe to the podcast, rate it, review it, tell us what you think, send it to a friend. Till next time, I'm James Keys. I'm Tune Day with Atlanta. All right, we'll talk soon.